Welcome everyone. As you have heard, this colloquium will be recorded. Um, I'm happy to see you at our first colloquium this academic year. The next colloquium will be online. Then the next next one and the following ones should be probably on site. And as you have seen, we had double changes of rooms. Probably uh, we'll finish in room D, but I'm happy to use uh, auditorium today. Uh, so let's start this series. Our first speaker this academic year is Marius Wancha. He finished his PhD last year at uh, Max Planck Institute in Potsdam, where he continued his postdoc. And this year he joined uh, the uh, gravitational physics group at the Vienna University. He's collaborator of uh, Mikołaj Kozinski. Unfortunately, Mikołaj uh, has COVID now, so he cannot join us. It's a pity that uh, Marius uh, went to Warsaw at exactly the same time at which Mikołaj had a positive result of his test. But well, <laughs> it's happening now. So Marius, I think it's time to start. The title is Pinhole Effects and Gravitational Lensing. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and I would like to thank Mikolai again for, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present my work over here. Okay, so today I'm going to talk mainly about spin-hole effects in, in the context of uh, general relativity and then after I present the theory, yeah, so let, let me start again for the online participants as well so that now they can hear me. So today I'm going to talk about spin-hole effects in general relativity and I'm going to try to present to you a way in which uh, these effects uh, might have actual observable uh, consequences. So actually about four years ago I, I gave another talk uh, at this institute also about spin-hole effects but at that time I was just uh, starting to work on this uh, subject and I hope uh, the presentation that I'm going to give today is going to be much more mature. Okay, so let me start with uh, a very brief uh, motivation, mainly an astrophysical motivation. So we generally test the predictions of general relativity by observing incoming electromagnetic or gravitational radiation and this radiation that we observe, it generally carries information about the source where it has been generated, but also very importantly, it, it carries information about uh, the medium on which it, it propagates, about the curved space-time on which it propagates. And generally we have a very good theoretical model for describing this. So we generally consider test fields on some fixed Lorentzian manifold, which is a solution of the Einstein field equations. So we, in, in, in most situations, we can neglect back reactions from the field onto the general relativity solution. And we can consider either Maxwell's equations or the equations of linearized gravity in order to describe the propagation of this uh, radiation. But however, these equations are, are partial differential equations and are rather, rather complicated to, to handle. But anyway, it turns out that for most uh, applications and for most uh, uh, predictions and, and observations, we can, we can basically use the geometrical optics approximation and, and this gives us uh, quite satisfactory results. And now, let me tell you a bit more about this geometrical optics approximation. So the main idea is to approximate the evolution given by the field equations with uh, a set of uh, transport equations along rays. So as I said, we are approximating the more complicated problem of solving a partial differential equation with the much more simpler pro problem of uh, solving coupled ordinary differential equations. So this, this transport equations over here. And the main assumption which allows us to do such an approximation is a separation of scales in the sense that the wavelength of uh, the electromagnetic or the gravitational waves that we want to describe is much, much smaller than the characteristic uh, radius of curvature of space-time. So then under this assumption, we can make this uh, geometrical optics approximation. 
And it, it is common in textbooks to find this statement that in the infinite frequency limit, we can say that light rays follow null geodesics. And it turns out that for most astrophysical uh, uh, application, this is this, this is a, a very good approximation, and we can describe uh, a lot of astrophysics phenomena based on this approximation. So just to give you a few examples, we can pretty much use geometrical optics approximation in, in the case of gravitational lensing. So here we have an example of what is called an Einstein ring, where the, the galaxy in, in the foreground acts as a lens for the uh, galaxy in the background, and because of gravitational lensing, we see the the galaxy in the background as this blue ring shape over here. And this is one scenario where using, uh, the, using the geometrical optics approximation and the fact that light rays follow no geodesics is, is a pretty much good approximation. Uh, a different example, which involves strong gravitational field, is uh, lensing around the black holes in the vicinity of black holes. And here we have a numerical simulation of uh, a black hole with an accretion disk, and in this situation as well, we can use geometric optics, and we can use the fact that light rays follow null geodesics to to describe uh, this image of the accretion disk around the, a black hole. Okay, but there is obviously the question of going beyond geometrical optics, and this is this is motivated by the following fact. So the geometrical optics approximation works very well in the limit of infinitely high frequencies. But of course, we know that the, the waves that we physically observe are not of infinite frequency, but of finite frequency. And then it is, obvious, it, it is quite natural to ask the question, can we do better? Can we improve on this geometrical optics approximation? And can we uh, better describe this uh, finite frequency effects? And one strategy of approaching this higher order corrections to geometrical optics is to, to look at, at other fields of, of physics and see what's the, what's the status over there. So for example, we can look in condensed matter physics or, or we can look in optics where these types of corrections to geometric optics has already been considered. And most of all, the, these corrections have been observed experimentally in the, in the form of spin hole effects, okay? So before going into spin hole effects, I think it, it's, uh, it's very uh, natural to start with a much simpler example. And I, I want to briefly present you this, uh, the simple example of the ordinary hole effect. And the reason I'm doing this is because even with the ordinary hole effect, we already see like the general features of hole effects in general, and then we can apply this intuition to spin hole effects. So, for the ordinary Hall effect, which I, I assume most of you are familiar with, one considers a piece of, uh, of metal and then flows a current through this uh, metal in the x direction over here. And then at some time we decide we want to turn on a magnetic field in the, the z direction as shown over here. And what happens is the electrons will experience an additional Lorentz force. So the electrons will get deflected. And because we have a piece of metal which is a finite size, the electrons will accumulate on the lateral side of the conductor. And over time, charge will accumulate on this lateral sides of the conductor. So what I want to emphasize here is that already this, this, uh, this cross product term that we see in the Lorentz force over here is one of the defining features of, of Hall effects as we will see later on for the spin Hall effects. And just to conclude here, with the ordinary Hall effect, we get this charge accumulation and then an electric field uh, in the y direction gra gradually build, builds out. And in the end, we, we get a steady state regime and in the lab, we can measure this uh, potential difference on the lateral sides of the conductor. Okay, so as I said, this very simple example already captures the general properties of Hall effects. And we can summarize this as follows. So we can say that Hall effects generally describe how the motion of a particle in some external potential is affected by its internal degrees of freedom. And this internal degree of freedom 
can be either electric charge, as we saw in the previous example, or it can be something else, something more general. It can be a young mills charge, it can be the spin of the particle, or, or it can be something else. We can come up with other examples as well. Uh, and now, another important fact before moving on, I would like to emphasize that, at least for, for the sake of this talk, whenever we talk about particles, we should really view these particles as an effective description for the dynamics of some localized wave packet. So in the case of the ordinary Hall effect, we can think of as, a, as the point particles as an effective description for some, some Dirac wave packets maybe and, and so on. And we, we will basically follow the same, uh, same idea when, when describing spin Hall effects. Okay. So now, what happens when we go to spin Hall effects? So th this is a particular type of Hall effects in which the internal degree of freedom is now represented by the, the spin of the particle or of the wave packet. And we get what are called spin orbit couplings, which means that we will have mutual interaction between the trajectory followed by the, the particle and the, the internal degree of freedom, the spin of the particle or of the wave packet. So, as a consequence, we get spin Hall effects, which basically mean that particles or wave packets will, will follow spin-dependent trajectories. And this is an effect that has been observed in, in, in many experiments uh, so far for electrons in condensed matter physics and also for electromagnetic waves traveling in, in various optical uh, materials. So, very briefly, for electrons in materials, we have the following situation. In certain types of materials, this effect arises when we flow a current in, in the x direction. And because of the properties of the material, what we get is that uh, electrons with spin up will, f will follow one trajectory, and electrons with spin down will follow a different trajectories. And in these materials, what we get, we get spin accumulation on the lateral sides of the conductor. Now, moving to what I would say is a bit more relevant for this talk, moving to the example of the spin all effect of light. This effect has been measured in, in various uh, experiments in the lab, but let me present here uh, one particular setup. So here, one has a, a, a glass cylinder and, and you have electromagnetic waves which are injected here in the, in the glass cylinder. And what you see is that as this, uh, this beam of electromagnetic wave propagates along the, along the cylinder, the, the beam gets split into two parts, one part with uh, right hand and the other hand with left hand circular polarization. So in the end, what we get is that uh, beams of opposite circular polarization follow slightly different uh, paths, and, and this has been, been measured over here. And the way to describe this effect is to consider Maxwell's equations. And then on Maxwell's equations, one can do a geometrical optics approximation, but also with higher order corrections. So going beyond the, the standard geometric optics results. And, and what we get is the following ray equations. So the terms in black over here are just the usual geometric optics uh, ray equation that one gets for, from Maxwell's equation in, in an inhomogeneous medium with an inhomogeneous refractive index. But then, due to this higher order correction, one gets an additional term over here, which on one hand depends on epsilon, which represents the wavelength. So the effect goes away in the limit of uh, infinite frequencies or in the limit of zero wavelength. The effect also depends on, uh, on uh, the state of circular polarization of the beam. So we have S over here, which will be plus or minus one, depending on the state of circular polarization. And then, somewhat similar to the ordinary Hall effect, we have this cross product structure over here. So in a nutshell, this is the spin Hall effect that people have measured for light in, uh, in various optical materials. And now what we would want to look at is a similar effect in general relativity where you have, for example, electromagnetic waves propagating on some, some curved space-time. 
And at the zeroth order, what we would expect is to recover the null geodesics. But then what we are really interested in are uh, similar corrections as the one over here. So corrections which depend on, on wavelength and also on the state of circular polarization of the electromagnetic wave. So this is, this is our aim. We would like to, to arrive at, at some equations like this. Okay, and before presenting you the actual equations, it is interesting to look a bit over the literature to see what is the, the status for what I will be calling the gravitational spin Hall effect. So a, as we look over the literature, we see that there have been various approaches trying to describe uh, something like this, something like a gravitational spin Hall effect. So the first one that I would like to mention is the approach of a spinning body in general relativity. This is a, a, a large uh, subfield of, of general relativity which, in which one generally uses what are called the matheson papa petro dixon equations. And these equations can be used to describe uh, spinning particles in general relativity quite general. And for the massless case, one can talk about the surreal saturnini equations, which are a particular case of the matheson papa petro dixon equations. So this is one approach that has been presented in in, in general relativity. A different class of approaches based on WKB or geometric optics type approximations, either for Maxwell's equations or for the Dirac equation and so on. Have, this have been presented in general relativity as well with uh, various results and, and various, uh, various claims which do not agree all the time. And then there is a final, a third class of approaches which have been used, which is a bit unconventional for, for general relativity, which involves using <laughs> techniques from relativistic quantum mechanics, namely this foldy waltheisen transformation for the bargman wigner equations, and similar results, although limited to some particular space-times, have, have also been obtained. Okay, so there is a broad class of uh, approaches towards uh, these types of effects in general relativity. The only problem that uh, I encountered while going through, through these uh, papers was that uh, some of them were limited to particular space-times, like static space-times, for example. And uh, sometimes there were like contradictory claims between, uh, between some papers and another paper, where one paper claims an effect in some space-time and Another paper says, okay, in that space time, there will be no effect. So th th there is a fair amount of disagreement between this prediction and there is no, th there was no, no general uh, theoretical framework for describing these pinhole effects. So about uh, four years ago, when I started working on this, that was the status of the, of the field. And uh, since then, we written a series of papers so the first paper over here, we, we described this gravitational spin hole effect for light in arbitrary space times and in a covariant way. So I think the, the theory that we presented here is, is uh, quite general. And then the next step was to extend these results to the case of gravitational waves. So in the second paper, we extended the, this method and we applied it to linearized gravity. So based on these two papers, we can say that we have a theory for this spin hole effects either for light or for gravitational waves. And then in this, uh, this most recent paper over here, we explored a bit the, the properties of, of these equations that we obtained. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into the derivation of these equations because that's, uh, that's another talk and maybe it's not that, it, it's very technical and maybe it's not that interesting. I'm just going to briefly present you the equations and, and we can go a bit over uh, the various terms that go into the equations and then we'll move to, to applications. So, so here are the ray equations we described the gravitational spin hole effect, which have been derived on one hand starting from Maxwell's equation and then on the other hand also starting for li from linearized gravity. And what we obtain is the following. Yes. 
Given the fact that there is this discrepancy various, uh, between various results in the literature, uh, can it uh, suggest that uh, basically this expansion procedure is not yet well defined? Yes, I mean, I if different I... people uh, try to construct an expansion and obtain different results, that is worrisome a little bit, right? It, it was also, yeah, that was one problem. It, it was also the case that some people were using a WKB type approximation and others were using uh, the Matheson power. Yes, but Dixon if they equation. both uh, control the same expansion parameter, the results should be identical. The question is, what is the expansion parameter here, or expansion parameter? What are expansion parameters, and how to make sure that you really catch up all the relevant terms? Because the problem is not, as you correctly described, is not trivial, right? There's no. compl complicated differential equations, some hidden scales, perhaps, etc., etc., etc. Right? Yeah. So. The expansion parameter is generally, in, in the WKB approximation, the expansion parameter is generally related to the wavelength. If you are in a black hole spacetime, then you can think of it as the ratio between the wavelength and the size of the black hole. So this would be this little epsilon that shows up over here in the equations. Uh, this is the case in the WKB approach, but there were also other approaches in which this was, uh, it, it was not clear what was the expansion parameter. So for example, in this uh, rather unconventional full de waltheisen approach, the expansion parameter was h-bar, even though there's, there's no need for h-bar, and in the end, when you get the final equation, all h-bars cancel out. So, yeah, the, the, the expansion, doing the expansion is not, uh, not so trivial. But we did it in, in this, uh, these two papers over here. I, I, I don't want to go too much into these details because this is a, completely separate talk of its own. Uh, in the end, what we're left with is this effective ray equations. And now the most important question to answer here is, okay, we have these effective ray equations which are supposed to describe the dynamics of the wave packet, but what, what is the actual physical significance of, of the word lines that will be described by these uh, trajectories? And to answer that, the physical significance is that these word lines should describe the motion of the energy centroid of the wave packet. This is, this is very important and I'm going to come back to this later. Okay, but now, for now, let, let's look a bit at the equations. So at the, the lowest order, the first terms that we get into the equations are just the usual geodesic equations, as we, we also saw in the case of uh, optics. But you are interested only in light-like uh, trajectories, yeah? Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah. And now at the next order, we, we get these corrections, which depend on, on S over here, which is the spin tensor. And the spin tensor is defined over here in terms of P and T, where P is the... Is T? T is, is, the, is an observer vector field. So as I said before, the equations are meant to describe the dynamics of the energy centroid of the wave packet. And energy centroids will always de depend on the choice of observer. So when you want to describe something like this, you have to say from the beginning, okay, this is my observer that observes the, the wave packet. And the energy centroid will always de be defined with respect to this observer T over here. You can see the observer also appears into the equations of motion. Okay, so we get this epsilon uh, and, and spin dependent corrections as in the case of optics again. And obviously these terms uh, will go away when you take epsilon going to zero. So this will be the spin, the spin S is uniquely <coughs> implied by, by, by this observer T, yeah? The spin tensor, you mean? Yes. So there is... Uh, no, no freedom in, in choosing the, the, the spin? No, there is freedom. So there is this little s uh, yeah, parameter, okay, but which will be plus, plus, one. Plus, one, plus or minus one for circularly polarized electromagnetic waves and plus or minus two for circularly polarized gravitational waves. Uh, yeah, but this is just a discrete choice. Yeah, You cannot, 
for instance, choose change a little bit the the spin, yeah. No, I mean you, you only have uh, this is the only freedom that you have in the fields. You can either have two on, only two states of polarization. You cannot have more than that. This is just what is called helicity. Yes, exactly. This is just uh, the helicity of the field. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the conclusion over here is that we have these equations with with epsilon uh, corrections and with also the correction depending on the, the state of circular polarization. And now, uh, before showing you how, how we can use this equation, I just want to say a bit more on the theory. So we can compare these equations with the with the well-known mathison power petro dixon equations. Maybe some of you are familiar, more familiar with these equations. And what we can show is that the spin hall equations are a particular case of the MPD equations written over here, where one chooses the following uh, spin supplementary condition, s dot t equals zero. We also choose a particular parametrization like here. And we also choose initial conditions as shown on the last line over here. So th this is important because the mathison power petro equations are quite general. They are meant to describe the dynamics of uh, localized objects with, con with conserved energy momentum tensor. So this is quite general. And it, it, is, it, it was natural to ask if the spin all equations have any relation to, the, to this set of equations. OK, so I think now I'm, I'm done with, uh, with the abstract theory. And I want to, to go to a more applied setup. The first thing that I can do, I, I can show you how, how these equations behave in, in a very simple situation. So for example, in Schwarzschild, what, what happens if we consider a Schwarzschild uh, background and somewhere over here where we have this yellow sphere, we, we say we have a source of light and we shoot with the same initial conditions, three different rays. On one hand, we shoot uh, the green ray, which corresponds to an all geodesic. And from the green ray, we get the expected uh, ordinary light bending that one would uh, see in Schwarzschild. And the geodesic is confined to a plane. And now from the same point and with the same initial condition, we, we shoot two light rays with opposite uh, circular polarization, the, the blue one and the red one. And what we get is, is the following. We, we see that there is a slight deviation from the geodesic plane. And we also see that there is an additional deflection angle off of the geodesic plane. So in a nutshell, this is the, the spin hole effect that we are seeing over here, this, this deflection away from the geodesic plane in, in Schwarzschild. Yeah. Uh, OK, I, I wanted to say something else, but I, let me see. Yeah, OK, the other thing that I wanted to say is that one can think of this setup as a, a stern gerlach device for, for circularly polarized photons, if you want, in the sense that you, you send in, uh, in circularly polarized photons and they get deflected one way or the other based on, uh, on the helicity of the photon. OK. Now, moving on to more concrete uh, applications, uh, namely trying to address in, in more general terms, the question of uh, polarization dependent uh, gravitational lensing. The natural question to ask over here is uh, uh, where, in, in which astrophysical scenarios should we look for signatures of the gravitational spin hole effect? In other words, which are the most likely situations to generate a significant gravitational spin hole effect? And what one learns after playing a bit with the numerical integration of the equations is that the effect becomes significant on one hand when you go to large wavelengths. But keep in mind that you cannot go to extremely large wavelengths because then you break the approximation. So you need to stay somewhere in, in an intermediate regime where, where you have intermediate wavelengths where your approximation still works, but you try to maximize the size of the effect. And then the other thing that you need is strong gravitational fields. Okay, so 
the first bullet point here suggests that using light to look for the effect might, might not be the best thing to do in an astrophysical setup. Uh, the other thing that we can do instead is use gravitational waves because we, we know that the observed gravitational wave, waves have wavelengths which are several orders of magnitude larger than for the electromagnetic waves. And then we also want to satisfy the second bullet point of having strong gravitational fields. So then if we really want to have a good chance of seeing the, this uh, spin-hole effect in some astrophysical setup, we should really look for lensing of gravitational waves in very strong gravitational fields. So th this is what, uh, what I've been done with my collab I have been do doing with my collaborators over here, as you can see in this recent paper, where we, we basically studied lensing of gravitational waves in, in very strong gravitational fields. So for example, one system that we had in mind is a hierarchical triple, which consists of three black holes, or another system that we, a more concrete system that we have in mind is active galactic nuclei, which, in, in which you can have uh, multiple black envir environments with multiple black holes, and you can imagine that two black holes will merge and will produce uh, a signal that then gets lensed by another black hole. So more concretely, here is a, a graphical representation of, of an active, active galactic nuclei. And in the center here, we have a supermassive black hole. And it is, it is common in these systems to have, around the supermassive black hole in, in this environment, to have other black holes, which are, are quite dynamical. And for example, as you see in this, uh, in this white square over here, we can have this type of system where we have three black holes where two of the black holes are merging while at the same time orbiting around the third black hole. And we think that this is, this is the type of system where this uh, spin-hole effect is uh, most likely to be seen because here the merging black holes will generate gravitational waves and then these gravitational waves will experience the strong gravitational field of the third black hole and they will get lensed. So this is the astrophysical setup that we we tried to describe in this paper, and we, we are doing this in the following way. So this is, this is our, our, our setup. So we consider a Kerr black hole representing the lens, as, and, and this, is a, this is the background. And then on this uh, background space-time, we consider on one hand a static source of gravitational waves, somewhere close to the Kerr black hole. And we also consider a static observer somewhere far away from the black hole. And now, having this setup in mind, the general strategy that uh, we adopted is the following. We, we compute the connecting rays between the, the source and the observer. And once we have the connecting rays, given by the spin-hole equations that I showed you before, then at the observer, we, we look at the time delay or the difference in the time of arrival of, uh, between the geodesic and the spin hall uh, trajectories. And then once we characterize these time delays, we look at how these time delays affect the gravitational waveforms that will be observed at the location of the observer. Okay, so let's, let's start with the first step and I'll briefly show you how the first uh, step works here and then we'll, we'll move on to the following ones. So, in the image on the left over here, we have uh, uh, the following setup. So we, we, in black over here, we have the black hole. And then with red, we have the source of gravitational waves. And with blue, we have the observer somewhere far away. And now we want to find connecting uh, trajectories between the source and the observer. But the problem is that the either the geodesic equations or the spin-hole equations that I showed you before are like an initial value problem in which you prescribe the initial location, you prescribe the source as the initial location, and then you shoot in some direction. So there is the first problem of finding the connecting trajectories between the source of, and the observer. So basically, instead of solving the initial value problem, we want something like a boundary value problem. And the way to do this numerically is to, to start at the source 
and, and to shoot in all possible directions until you find the, the connecting trajectories. And in, in order to, to, to speed this up a bit, you, you need, to, to, you need a, a, bit, a, a better strategy a bit. And what we do is the following. So we fix the observer somewhere far away, let's say on a sphere of r equal 100. And then from the source, we, we, we shoot in, in some direction. And when we reach r equal 100, then we stop the numerical integration. And we compute the following angular distance. So we compute the angular distance on the sphere of the observer between where the trajectory reached and where the observer is. And then in order to find the connecting trajectory, we try to minimize this angular distance. So if, if we parameterize the initial momentum like over here, where E0 to E3 is an orthonormal tetrad, and we have two parameters, K2 and K3, this angular distance is plotted over here as a function of K2 and K3, which are the initial directions in which you shoot. And you see that for some if you shoot in some particular direction over here in the middle, then the ray falls into the black hole. So this middle white area over here on the, on the, the right is represented by the shadow of the black hole. But now if, if you shoot in some, some slightly different direction, then the ray will, will reach the sphere of the observer and it will be at a certain angular distance from the observer on that sphere. And this, this is given by by the color scale here on, on the right. Now you want to minimize this angular uh, distance. And for example, doing this for geodesics, you, you get two minima. You get a red dot down here and another red dot up here. So these are the two minima, meaning that if you shoot in these two particular directions, then you will find two connecting geodesics. Obviously, you can find more connecting geodesics, but here we are ignoring the ones that loop around the black hole several times, so we only focus on these two. And now what you can do is, instead of shooting with the geodesic equations, you can shoot with the spin hole equations. And now you, you will get these lines over here around the red dots, which correspond to the s equal plus 2 and s equal minus 2 trajectories. And instead of a dot, you get a line because you vary epsilon. So as you, as you increase epsilon or the wavelength of the radiation, you see that you have to shoot in a slightly different direction. So that, this is why you get a line instead of the dot. The, the line just encodes the epsilon dependence because you do this for a, for a whole range of epsilons. So after you find all these connecting trajectories for different s and for different uh, wavelength, then you arrive at this uh, picture here on, on the left where you see all these uh, rainbow-like trajectories. So the, the colors of the rainbow basically encode the, the wavelength. So you see that the geodesic is, lies in the middle and it corresponds to, to, to blue. And then as you, as, you increase, as you increase your wavelength, you move from blue towards uh, green and then yellow and then, then red. And also you have for, for each for, for the upper trajectories and for the lower trajectories for each, you have like a double rainbow because one half of the rainbow corresponds to one value of the spin and the other half of the rainbow corresponds to the second value, to the other to opposite value of the spin. Okay, so now we, we have these connecting trajectories and we have here on the left, we have basically two bundles of connecting trajectories, one bundle that goes up and the other bundle that goes uh, a bit down. And now what we want to do is to describe the time delays that the observer sees. Because e even though this ray, all these rays connect the source and the observer, the rays will, will reach the observer at different times, depending on one hand on uh, the spin and also depending on the, on the wavelength of the radiation. Okay, so we move forward and we try to characterize this, uh, this time delays. I'm going to call this upper bundle, I'm going to call it the bundle number one, and the lower bundle, I'm going to call it the, the bundle number two. In general, the time delay between one bundle and the second bundle is order 10 seconds in this particular example. 
while the delays within the bundle will be order microseconds or milliseconds, so it, it is safe to focus only on, on, on one bundle, for example, or, or to treat the two bundles separately. Okay, so now we look at the time delays. And the first thing that we want to plot here on, on the left, you see this, uh, this blue plot, the blue, the blue line and the, the dashed line, which is almost exactly on top of it. This represents the time delay for the upper bundle between the geodesic time of arrival and the time of arrival of the spin hall uh, trajectories as a function of wavelength. So you see, for, for very small wavelengths, basically there's no time delay, and then as you increase, as you increase the wavelength, the time delay gradually increases. And for the second bundle, you get uh, you get this the, this other two two curves, which are almost exactly overlapping, like the green and the other dotted curve over here. Excuse and me. Yes. What does epsilon means? What are the units? For ten to minus one, how? Epsilon, you can think of epsilon over here as the wavelength in units where m equals one, the mass of the black hole equals one. Mm. So epsilon 10 to the minus one means that the wavelength is uh, one over 10 times the, times the, let's say, half of the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole. Okay, so it's to be ever long actually already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what what matters in in all this setup is like the ratio between the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole and the wavelength of the radiation. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. So, so now we we have these time delays, and we can learn much more by by plotting this on a log log plot, as we see here on the right, and then we get these upper two curves, which represent the time delay between the spin hole and the geodesic trajectories. And what we find is quite remarkably that in, in almost all setups that we, we tried, almost all observer source configuration, we get that this, this time delay is proportional to epsilon to the power square, or wavelength to the power square, if you want. And basically, this means that now you have this, this quite simple power law for describing the time delay. and you can basically describe any configuration by just one number, which is the number in front of the epsilon to the power two power law. Now, the second thing that you can do, uh, as, as I told you here on, on the figure on the left, you have like this blue line and then you have a, a dashed line almost exactly on top of it. So one line is for, for the delay for one polarization and the other one, the delay for the second polarization. Now, you can take the difference between these two almost overlapping curves, and you can look at the time delay between, uh, between the plus two polarization and the minus two polarization, or as we call it here, the, the time delay between the right to left circular polarization. And we get this uh, epsilon to the power three dependence. So th this is a, basically a, a higher order effect and it, it, it encodes uh, the, the time delays between opposite circular polarizations. Okay, so si since this holds quite generally for, for all source and observer configuration, now, as I said, we, we can basically describe time delays very simply by, by just uh, investigating this proportionality factor for the power law. So we have uh, beta 1 here for this uh, epsilon to the power 2 power law, and we have this beta 2 for this epsilon to the power 3 power law, and th th this is quite robust and, and quite, uh, quite nice. Now, we can look at some particular example where we vary the, the position of the observer and see how this beta varies as we change the position of the observer. So, we fix the source uh, as over here in the equatorial plane close to the black hole, and then we, we vary the theta position of the observer, and, and what we get is the following. So for the spin hole to geodesic delay, we see that the, 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 eps, the epsilon to the power two exponent, which is here alpha, it, it, it basically stays almost constant or very close to two. 
So it's, it's uh, quite safe to approximate alpha equal to for, for all these cases. And then for beta, we see the following dependence over here on the bottom. We see that beta will be maximized when, uh, when the observer is in the equatorial plane and it, it gradually decreases as the observer is moved away from the equatorial plane. Uh, we can also look at the, sp the spin hole to spin hole delay between the opposite polarizations here on, on the right. And again, we see that in this case, alpha, the exponent, stays very close to 3. And then we also have some dependence of the proportionality factor beta in this case. And here we see that if the observer is in the equatorial plane, then this, this uh, effect goes to 0, basically. So there's the, the, the beta in this case will be 0. But this, this doesn't matter too much because, because this spin hole to spin hole delay is, is of higher order anyway. So we'll not focus too much on this uh, uh, right part uh, of the plot. OK, so now we have like this general way of characterizing time delays. Basically, beta will characterize the behavior of the, the, the frequency behavior of the time delay in all situations. And now with this result, what we should do is we should try to describe uh, how the gravitational waveforms are affected. So it, it, is, it is well known that if you have a time delay in, in, in the time domain, then in the frequency domain, you will have a phase shift. So what this means is that this, uh, this time delay that we obtain, this, this delta t, this delta tau, sorry, is, is now can now be viewed as a, as a phase shift if we describe gravitational waveforms in the frequency domain. And this is what we are going to do over here in equation five. So we start with the unlensed uh, signal h that we have here on the, on the, in equation five on the right. And then what we do on top of this, we, we put the time delay that we just computed as a frequency dependent phase shift. So this delta t in the exponent that we have over here is this frequency dependent uh, phase shift. And by the way, n labels the bundles, the, the ray bundles that I told you before, for, but for simplicity, we can just assume that there's only one, uh, one bundle for the moment. And the other term that I didn't told you about so far is this square root of mu over here, where mu represents the magnification. The mu is basically telling us how the amplitude of the signal uh, will change. But again, this, this will not, uh, mu will not play a, a very important role in, in what I'm going to show you. OK, so we have this way of, uh, of computing the, the corrections to the gravitational waveforms. And we would also like to have like a way of quantifying this difference. And usually, when people analyze gravitational waves, one way of quantifying the difference between two waveforms is to use what is called the mismatch, which is defined over here in uh, equation six, is basically this scalar product that you see over here, where the scalar product is defined in, in seven. S is, is a, represents the noise, which we, we assume to be one. This, this might depend on, on the properties of the detector, but it's, uh, it's quite safe to assume it is one for the sake of this calculation. Okay, so now let me show you some uh, actual gravitational waveforms. So for some particular source in observer configuration, we, we look at the waveforms that one would get by using only the geodesics and the waveforms that one would get using the spin hole uh, trajectories. So the blue, the blue curve that we, you see over here represents the geodesic signal. And then we have two, two examples that one gets by using the spin hole equations. So depending on the maximum value of epsilon, so like the maximum wavelength that the signal will have, you, you get two different uh, curves. You get the orange curve and then you get the, the green curve. And you can already see that these are quite different. So even without computing the mismatch, you, you can already see that the signals are quite different. And naively, just by looking at the plot, you would already assume that uh, our gravitational wave detectors might be able to see such a significant difference between the two signals. So in, in particular, the difference is, is larger 
in the low low frequency regime, and then as expected, the, the difference between the signals generally decreases as you go towards the merger and really close to the merger where, where this is characterized by high frequencies. Basically, you don't, uh, you don't really see, see the, the effect. So the low frequency part of the signal is where you naturally expect to see this uh, effect. Okay, but nevertheless, let, let's compute the mismatch for these two cases. So for the first case, you get mismatch of 3%, and for the other case, you get a mis mismatch of uh, 29%. And what does this uh, tell us? What, what does the mi mismatch tell us? Uh, basically, the mismatch can be used to, to define this distinguishability criteria between two, two waveforms, and, and this is roughly like this. If mismatch times signal-to-noise ratio squared is greater than 1, then in principle your gravitational wave detector can uh, can see the effect can see the difference between the two waveforms and typical signal to noise ratios for for ligo so far are around order 10 let's say between 10 and and 50 maybe so in, in principle that there should be no problem to to see such an effect in ligo even if your mismatch is is 3% or even less let's say so what I'm trying to say over here is that for some reasonable configuration that might occur in, a, in an actual astrophysical setup, assuming this uh, event happens somewhere in the universe, then LIGO might be able to see this effect. And this means that it, it might be able to measure this uh, gravitational spin-hole effect for gravitational waves. This this might be important because if you measure this effect, then you can you might be able to say more about uh, the environment, the the galactic environment where the the merger took place. You might be able to say something about the lens and so on. So it it is uh, I, I believe this is this is an important uh, aspect. Okay, so this is the. The main takeaway message that, in principle, the gravitational spin-off effect for gravitational waves might be detected in, in this setup. And I'm, I'm going to go to the conclusions right now, and then I'll, I'll take your questions. So very briefly, the conclusions are as following. We now have this covariant framework, which works quite generally in, in arbitrary spacetimes for describing spin-hole effects, either for electromagnetic waves or for, for gravitational waves, as I showed you over here. On the theoretical side, uh, the equations of motion are a special case of the well-known mathison power petro dixon equation. Also, other theoretical aspect that I didn't show to tell you about the equations is that you can use the equations to recover various other known uh, limits and, and uh, various other known effects from optics. And now, again, as, as I showed you in the second part of my talk, these spin-hole effects can be significant for strongly lensed gravitational waves. And there is a non-zero potential for experimental observation of this uh, effect for gravitational waves. And this could, uh, could have important uh, astrophysical consequences. OK. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward for your comments and questions now. Let's thank the speaker first. So now we have time for questions, and the first question is of uh, Bojana. Can you go back to your uh, previous plot, right? Oh, this one, exactly. Uh, because in the data, when you uh, plan to tell, uh, you can detect the difference between your prediction and the model. The key question is that normally you have this blue line, which is geodesic, uh, and this is fixed because you know what you assumed about the source. The key question is, if you modify the blue curve, assuming slightly different uh, inclination, masses, whatever, will any of this combination look like one of your green curves or none of those? Okay, so basically the question is, if the, let, let's say the beta parameter coming from the spin hole correction is degenerate with any other parameters that uh, 
the gravitational waveform might have. Uh, so far, we we didn't look into this. It's uh, it's the next step, the next step to see, natural step to this is to see how adding this additional correction to the waveform will affect, for example, parameter estimations. Because when you measure something in LIGO, obviously you don't get two signals to to compare them. You you get just one signal, and then you you have to do parameter estimation on on that signal, and we would have to ask the question, how is this process of parameter estimation uh, affected by by our correction? And it, it might be or it might not be that our correction term is degenerate with some other terms that go into the process of the parameter estimation. But we, we didn't do this so far. It, it's it's one of the next steps that we're, we're thinking of, of addressing. OK. I've seen that there is a question of Mikolai Korzynski. So, Mikolai, please. Um, hello. Uh, that was a very nice talk. So, my question is a little bit along the lines of Bozena. Um, so, apart from the standard parameters, in, in case of this um, act, uh, active galactic nucleus, uh, in this case, this uh, binary black hole would orbit around a larger body. This means that on top of that, you might have actually fairly large time-dependent corrections from um, time-dependent Doppler, um, time-dependent propagation of, of, of light. So if, apart from these standard things, there's I can imagine other effects which could spoof this effect in, in, in many ways. So I think there should be a step after that step, namely considering something like mo motion in, 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 in this large black hole. Uh, space-time effects it's just a remark yeah so so this is one thing that we have in mind that this is one way of extending our, our cal calculation so for example instead of assuming the source is static over here we should assume it is orbiting around the black hole and j just let me do uh, tell you a few few comments about this so for the for the mass ratios that we considered over here uh, the masses of the merging black holes in the waveform that I showed you are around 30 to 50 solar masses. And the mass of the lens is around 10 to the power 4, 10 to the power 5 solar masses. So there's a significant difference between them. And then if you want to place the merging black holes, say, at the ISCO, then the period of the ISCO would be, I think, of order 1 to 10 seconds, something in that area while you see over here the duration of the signal is order 0 0.1 seconds. So this signal in this particular case is emitted while the, the, the merger does like 1% of the orbit or 2% of the orbit. So for this particular setup, I think this approximation is okay for the moment, but I agree with you. It, it would be nice to extend this to have uh, orbiting uh, sources around the, the black hole, but that that would not. Uh, I, I don't think that would change the effect fundamentally. What would do, on the other hand, that would uh, basically modulate uh, the amplitude of your signal. But you would also see this. Uh, I think this pinhole on top of this modulated signal. Okay. So the last question. What bothers me is the value of the parameter A of the black hole. It is very, very high, not, not, not uh, very realistic, I would say. Yes, but the, the parameter ha A has very little effect. And, and let me show you a plot for that. I have an extra plot. So uh, you can look at, at how beta changes when you, you, you vary the spin of the black hole. Mm -hmm. So you fix a source and an observer somewhere and you, now you vary the spin of the black hole. And you ask yourself, how does this beta, which, which describes the, the size of the effect, change when you change the black hole spin? And for, for this beta, which describes the delay between the spin hole and the geodesic, you see that this actually decreases as you increase uh, the spin of the black hole. So actually, the effect would be larger if you consider a Schwarzschild black hole. Mm -hmm. And this, this other beta, which describes uh, 
th this higher order beta basically which describes the delay between the opposite polarizations. This would be zero in Schwarzschild, but then this would grow a bit in Kerr. But anyway, this is the higher order effect that for for now this can be ignored. So in principle, in the effect would be larger in, in Schwarzschild. As we are running out of time, I propose to thank the speaker again.